Hello? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ronald? Yeah, I can hear you. I was, I was speaking. I don't know if everybody can hear me. I, I can. Now I can hear you. I couldn't before, but now, now I can. Now you can't hear me? Oh. Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay. I can hear you. Yes. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yes. So. Okay. So, I don't know whether people. I'm halfway through uh, uh, explaining my vision, but uh, can uh, has anybody heard me so far? Yes, I think they can hear you now. They can hear me now. Okay. Okay. So let's start. Yeah, so, so well, first of all, uh, thank you very much to Spain NAV for uh, inviting me to this event and giving me the, the, the honor of uh, interviewing you, Ronald, uh, one of the most influential people in impact economy and, and the father of, of social impact investment. So um, I would like to start like uh, talking, of course, about the, the vision that you uh, you you so well uh, explain, in, and I will highly recommend the book, by the way, a best-selling book uh, about impact economy. So could you tell us a little bit about your vision for uh, impact economy and uh, the challenge uh, of, of measuring impact and not just risk and return uh, as a dimension uh, in any decision making in the economy? And uh, as you mentioned in the book, there are more than 100 50 initiatives globally to uh, trying to measure impact and defining impact uh, being uh, the impact weighted accounts uh, one of the most uh, most important ones i will say uh, or promising ones uh, could you explain a little bit more about your vision of impact economy and how initiatives like impact weighted accounts uh, initiative um, are, are uh, helping making that that impact economy a reality Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, wonderful to be here with you. Thank you very much, uh, Juan, for the very warm introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, virtually uh, in Spain. I'm sorry that I can't be there in, uh, in person. Uh, so to answer your question, Rebecca, uh, I believe we're at a historic crossroads, and that's why I wrote the book. Uh, our system is self-defeating. Uh, we are digging a deeper and deeper hole for ourselves environmentally and socially. Uh, environmentally, we don't need to dwell on it for, for long. We can see the threats of uh, global warming increasing year by year with no action really uh, coming to influence it in a major way. And socially, we have had inequality break out into violence in France, in Chile, in the Lebanon, in the United States. And these inequalities have grown to a degree uh, similar to that uh, of uh, the 30s, um, that it threatens the stability of our society. And I wrote the book because I felt that if we continue to throw money in old ways at uh, problems, uh, that uh, this money doesn't help to solve, uh, and then the situation ahead of us is going to be drastic. What we need to do is to change our system. Uh, we don't want to give up free markets and entrepreneurship and, and capital. They have uh, led to huge economic progress for mankind. And even uh, communist systems like uh, China's are shifting to state capitalism. So we don't want to give up. Um, free markets. But what we do want to do is to overthrow the what I call the tyranny of profit. Overthrow the pursuit of profit on its own by bringing impact by its side. What does that mean? That means that if the world has shifted over centuries from looking just at the return uh, that an investment makes through to the uh, second half of the last century when we started to measure risk and then over the last 70 years ago to look at risk and return when we make business and investment decisions. The world is shifting. Not only must it shift, but it, it's already shifting 
to optimizing risk return and impact. We can see it, Rebecca, in uh, 30 to 40 trillion dollars of environmental, social and governance uh, investing today. That's equivalent to a third or a half of all professionally managed financial assets in the world. That, Rebecca, is way beyond tipping point. You look at impact investment, as uh, Juan uh, was pointing out, $700 billion today. Six years ago, when we wrote the G8 report, we talked about the first trillion dollars. Little did we think that it would happen within six years. This year, we will hit a trillion dollars of uh, impact investment. But what does impact actually mean if you don't measure it? And in the same way that uh, our predecessors in 1929 sat up and said, my God, we've been investing in companies without understanding what profit they make, because every company could pick its own accounting principles and there were no auditors to verify the numbers. And the legislation came in 33 um, to make generally accepted accounting principles uh, the rule and to bring in auditors. And at the time, there were plenty of people in the US Congress who claimed that this would be the end of American capitalism. Well, today, we're in the same position with regard to impact, Rebecca. We have a third to a half of all investable, not all investable, all professionally managed money uh, going to achieve more than profit, to achieve impact through ESG and impact investing. And we have no transparency at all on the impact that companies create. Now, the breakthrough of technology and big data has brought us a breakthrough in measuring impact. And just uh, last, uh, in the last three weeks or so at Harvard Business School, uh, an effort uh, called the Impact, uh, uh, the Impact Weighted Accounts uh, Initiative uh, has published the environmental impact created by 1,800 companies. And when you look at that data set, Rebecca, you discover some really appalling things. You discover that out of the 1,800 companies, 250 or more deliver more environmental damage a year than they do profit you discover that a third of the companies deliver 25% of their profit in environmental damage a year. And next year we will be publishing the employment impact and the product impact. And of course your own venture is helping us to measure the product impact of, uh, of companies. And we will be able to look at the total impact that the company creates. That presents us with the opportunity now to publish impact-weighted accounts. And governments should now mandate, just as we did in 1933 with regard, at least the US government did, with regard to generally accepted accounting principles, that companies starting two years from now publish their impact-weighted accounts. It will change the meaning of profit, of value, and of success. We will have all of the advantages that are provided by the profit motive, while also judging success and value according to the contribution that companies and investors make to improving lives and the planet. Uh, so, so one one question then to to that Ronald on on the impact weighted accounts initiative. Imagine that we. Uh, make this the standard. Hopefully, we will make the, the impact weighted accounts uh, the, the accounting standard for impact. Now, how do we make sure that companies, global companies, that are present everywhere in the world, so not, not just one government will affect how they report uh, potentially? So, okay, how can we make sure, and what's the role of the governments and corporates and investors to actually make corporates adopt that impact weighted account? Um, uh, reporting uh, for, for, for impact, basically, going forward. So, so there are several forces pushing us there, Rebecca. Uh, this whole 
impact movement was really first expressed by young consumers like yourself uh, shunning uh, the products of companies whose values they didn't share and then refusing to work for these companies. And that made investors aware that uh, these changing preferences among consumers were going to affect the values of the companies in their portfolios. And today we have the huge sums that I've described in ESG and impact investment. So the combination of consumers, employees and investors, backed by philanthropists who fund the organizations that are pushing us in, in, in this direction, like uh, or leading us in this direction, like uh, the GSG, is going to bring governments to realize that we have the right to know, right? The right to know is today a human right. We have the right to know what impact companies are delivering. And for governments, it brings a very necessary uh, force to help it make it through COVID sooner and recover better, in a better position to create a fairer uh, and, and more sustainable world, as uh, Juan was saying, than we had before. Mm -hmm. Governments are going to emerge from this crisis, as we all know, with huge amounts of debt. And they're going to be facing much greater social issues through unemployment, uh, which is likely to remain high for some time. Big companies are going to be slimming down rather than recruiting. We're going to have to have a very big push to create employment. And a lot of people are going to suffer in that process, are going to need reskilling. A lot of people are going to be made homeless. We're going to have to deal with them. A lot of elderly people are going to be robbed of their livelihood. We're going to have to deal with them. And the state can't do it all by itself. The state needs business and investment in order to make it through this crisis. So it will come by all of these forces pushing us uh, to it, as happened in, in 1933. In a way, Rebecca, it's the new New Deal. Uh, the new New Deal is to bring companies and investment to improve society and to improve the environment. Now, will it be the force of investors on companies, the demands of investors of government, that the governments must regulate now transparency on impact in the way that they did in 1933, uh, transparency on, on, on profit? It's not 100% clear. We're living in times where international action, concerted action, is extremely difficult. The world is highly polarized. So it may be that some countries will lead uh, others. Um, and probably that is what's going to happen. At the same time, we need to push through the G7 and the G20 uh, for concerted uh, action. And this is something that has to happen in the next two or three years, Rebecca. Governments must mandate this in the next two or three years. The situation is urgent. Mm -hmm. And apart from uh, having the government's mandate these, maybe regulate, so companies report, investors also report, that's happening already in Europe. Um, uh, so what, uh, and by the way, uh, just uh, to make sure the audience knows this, uh, we're going to open it up in, in 10 minutes or so for Q&A to, to Ronald, okay? So you can uh, ask your questions through the Spark app, uh, app okay? Um, yeah, the, I'm being told that the, the app is already active for you to, to send questions to Ronald. So, uh, so I was saying that, Ronald, so the role of the government, as you were saying, is very important uh, uh, whether or not they regulate reporting for companies, for investors, uh, but also in the creation of impact investment wholesale funds that you uh, also yeah. mentioned in your book. Uh, actually, Spain uh, is advocating uh, for, for the Spanish government and other society uh, stakeholders to create one of those funds that uh, li like the ones that were already created in the UK, South Korea, Japan, and, and Portugal. So why is, it, why is it so important, the, the creation of these kind of uh, um, impact investment wholesale funds, 
And what would be your advice uh, to make that a reality in Spain as well? So apart from uh, government, uh, the charitable sector uh, helps to tackle social issues. And the charitable sector, through donations only, is not able to help uh, charitable organizations to grow and cope with the increasing demands on them. And so as early as 2000, uh, the Social Investment Task Force, 20 years ago now, recommended that we must bring investment to the social sector. An impact wholesaler is crucial to achieve this. If we look at what happened in the UK, in which I was very privileged to be involved in the creation of big society capital, uh, the government allowed us to take 400 million pounds of unclaimed assets in banks. These are bank accounts that have been separated from their owners for 15 years or more. And our four leading banks added another 200 million pounds. With that 600 million pounds of capital, we have funded not-for-profit organizations and profit with purpose businesses across the UK. We have attracted about $2 billion, forgive me, another $1.4 billion pounds, uh, in addition to the $600 uh, million that we have invested. We have given funds the ability to invest in charitable organizations through social impact bonds, uh, uh, for instance, to provide them with the capital to grow. And when these charitable organizations under a social impact bond contract, as you know, hit their targets, their investors make a return of, uh, you know, of, of five or six or, or seven percent uh, net. Uh, and they can raise more money. The charitable organizations can raise more money. So an impact wholesaler is a huge um, uh, force in helping the social sector to grow. It's also a very important champion with government of the role of impact investment in the economy. So it can help government to define the policies that are required at the time when we're going to have more vulnerable people hit harder uh, to advise the government on how to use the social sector and investment and companies to help the most vulnerable through this crisis because governments alone will not be able to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and shifting a little bit now to the role of investors, and you touched a little bit on, on that. I, I think many people uh, in the audience today are uh, investors. So you, you mentioned that there are already $30 trillion invested in environmental social government uh, strategies, so ESG strategies. Uh, and, and I believe there is uh, some confusion among investors, and I know that also from my own experience with my, uh, with our software tool at, at Clarity that is uh, is targeted to, to investors to understand the, the sustainability of their investment. So how could the investors make sense and differentiate the different sustainable investing or social and environmental impact strategies? Uh, BNB, ESG, as you mentioned, one of the most popular ones, but uh, there are other strategies and frameworks like the UN Sustainable Development Goals or impact investing. So how could the investors make sense of all those different frameworks and what are the differences among those, those different investment strategies? So it, it's not complicated. Uh, ESG has the intention to create positive impact or to minimize negative impact. So ESG investing means you don't invest in companies that are high polluters or that use child labor uh, or create other social and environmental uh, problems. But you don't measure the impact. You rely on reporting by companies which focuses on the good that companies do and doesn't analyze the harm. And until we measure and can net off the positive and negative impacts of companies to say these companies are net impact positive and profitable, these companies are net impact negative and profitable, until we can do that, investors can't make intelligent decisions about it. They're blindfolded, trying to feel their way through uh, the environmental issues through public information and, and so on. Impact investing, on the other hand, 
have the same intention, but measures the impact created. So in impact venture capital, in impact private equity, increasingly in green bonds and so on, there are criteria for measuring the performance at an impact level, just as we measure profit. So that is the big difference. Now the SDGs, the SDGs are the social development goals, as everybody knows, that have been set by the United Nations. They face a $30 trillion hole if we want to achieve them uh, by the end of this decade. Bringing in impact transparency would enable every company to connect its impact to one of the SDGs. You could actually invest in companies because they further achievement of specific SDG. And you would also find yourself in a, in a situation where there would be a race to the top. Companies would begin to perform both at a profit level and at an impact level. That's why I think transparency is really the next frontier, not just for investment and for companies, but for our whole economic system for capitalism. We have to have a system that delivers achievement of goals like the SDGs. No amount of encouragement and exhortation can get companies to change their behavior if all they're focusing on is making money and creating huge environmental damage in, in the process. There is one Spanish company on the database, on the data set at Harvard Business School, that delivers nearly $200 billion of environmental damage a year. Okay, there are some industries where it's inevitable that you deliver environmental damage. But if you look within these industries, you will find some leaders and laggards, just as we do with regard to uh, profit. Okay, and the same will be true of employment impact. A company like Intel delivers $7 billion of supposed positive employment impact because that's its wage bill in the United States. But when you begin to measure the demographics around Intel facilities and the demographics within Intel and to apply the salary and wage levels uh, for these missing people from these uh, underrepresented communities and when you look at differences in gender pay and, and so on, uh, again, all this from the Harvard Business School uh, work, the positive employment impact that Intel delivers is reduced by half. Now, Intel is a leader in pushing for the well-being and the diversity of its workforce. So, shouldn't we expose all other tech companies' numbers so that we create a race to the top? So, within industries, we see huge discrepancies, just as we do on, on profitability in impact performance. And that's why it is crucially important now that investors and consumers and employees and governments get transparency on the impact that companies create. Mm -hmm. and, and now to finalize before we move on to questions by the audience. Uh, in the closing of the book, you emphasize that the time is now, that this is something that needs to happen as soon as possible. Uh, and, and that was written uh, right before COVID uh, crisis. I think it was released uh, right after the, the, when, when the COVID crisis uh, started. And so, so what is your view on how COVID might accelerate or slow down this uh, adoption of the impact economy? Uh, I believe it's going to accelerate, actually. The, 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 to make impact economy a reality. But what is your view on why is, is it the time now and even more so with the COVID crisis? Uh, it is accelerating the process, uh, is what I see, uh, Rebecca. Uh, governments are very preoccupied with what is going to happen as we emerge from the crisis. Businesses are being helped by governments. Governments have the opportunity today to require businesses to provide this transparency. A lot of business leaders expect to go in this direction. I take the example of Danone, which published impact weighted uh, earnings per share uh, just uh, three, four weeks ago. There are 56 companies across the world that we've identified using some form of impact uh, accounting. COVID 
is accelerating this. Uh, we're aware of uh, the differences uh, that uh, stimulus programs that governments put in place exacerbate within society. The focus of governments on big companies and big financial institutions because they are the bedrocks of, 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 of the economy um, cannot continue. Uh, it has to address at the same time the vulnerable groups in society. We've gone through a period of 25 years where wages have remained stagnant, real wages, in many countries. Uh, while we've seen the returns of, uh, to capital go through the roof. The gap between the richest and, and the poorest today uh, is as great as it was before the 1929 crash. And so COVID is exacerbating all this and creating greater urgency for action. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't want to give you uh, all uh, the impression that there's just one Spanish company that is uh, causing harm. Let me give you an example from the chemical industry. If you look within the chemical industry, uh, you can pick three companies. Uh, Sasol in South Africa has 12 billion of sales, delivers $17 billion of environmental damage a year. Dolve, European company, has same level of sales and delivers $3.9 billion of damage a year. And BASF has $70 billion of sales and delivers $7.7 .7 billion of damage. So within the chemical industry, investors have the ability to make choices. And even if you believe in investing in fossil fuels, which I personally don't, if you look at a company like ExxonMobil through the data set, ExxonMobil delivers $39 billion of damage a year. I mentioned this in the book. Shell delivers $13 billion and BP-8, and they're roughly the same size. You'd have to be perverse uh, to invest in, if they have similar profitability, in the company that is creating the greatest environmental damage. Because as a good investor, you would realize that it's likely to get regulated it's likely to get taxed, talent will go away from it, and so on and so forth. So, if we expose the Trump, if we bring transparency, if we expose these differences, just as we do with profit now, we're going to create a race to the top. And we need it in order to emerge from uh, COVID sooner and in better shape to create a fairer and, and more sustainable world. Yeah, w one quick follow-up question to to that, Ronald. Whose role is to so who should be? Uh, and I assume that uh, Harvard Business School is going to be publishing that, uh, well, making that information available to investors who want to use it, right? But uh, who, whose role is uh, to to make that transparent? Because many of those companies are not reporting, so that's data that uh, Harvard so Business School has spent a lot of time. Uh, uh, distilling and, and even estimating data that was not available, etc. So who, whose role is, is, is So So interestingly, Rebecca, the 1,800 companies only have 20% of estimated numbers. 80% are made, is information made public by companies. Mm -hmm. Who is going to make this information available? It's going to be on your Reuters terminal, on your Bloomberg terminal. Uh, the rating agencies are going to be defining uh, uh, investment vehicles that avoid certain types of companies and, and favor others. Uh, we're going to be valuing companies on the basis of, uh, in my view, their impact weighted profit. We're going to be drawing a correlation between level of impact weighted profit and future growth because if the talent is going to go to the companies that do good and do well at the same time, you'd expect them to do better. Uh, it's going to encourage competition by entrepreneurs who define new business models, just as uh, Tesla uh, did with electric uh, cars, uh, that uh, basically disrupt the whole of their industries. Uh, and uh, a unicorn, uh, which is a venture that becomes worth a billion dollars, as an impact unicorn, would be one that also 
improves the lives of a billion people. These things are happening, as I explain in, in Impact in, in my book already, by giving examples about it. Look, humankind has progressed hugely. Uh, and when our challenges change, we have to change the ways of addressing them. The scale of our environmental and social challenges is so great now that we have to get our companies and our investors to bring solutions and to stop creating problems negligently in pursuit of profit alone. Yeah, uh, completely agree with that with that vision, uh, Ronald. I can agree more actually. Uh, and uh, on on the questions from the audience, can we see those? Uh, okay. Uh, I think, can you see the questions, Ronald? Or you want me, you yes, need me to, re okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, so, I mean, on the, on the first uh, question, uh, Spain should lead by changing the role of trustees of pension funds and foundation uh, endowments uh, like uh, like Aisha and other big uh, 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 foundations which are capable of doing a lot of good in, in Spanish uh, society, as well as the role of directors. We need to shift the obligations of trustees from making profit to having to take impact into account. It's not may take other considerations and profit into account, it's must take other considerations, environmental and social, uh, as well as profit into account when making investment decisions. Once the Spanish government gives a clear message to pension fund trustees that this is allowed, you can expect to see a lot more money uh, flow from them. When you get your investors shifting their money uh, from one company to another, reducing the value of some companies and increasing the value of others, which comes through in the data set at Harvard. Uh, the Harvard data set shows already a correlation in certain sectors between higher levels of pollution and lower valuation. And transparency will, will make that the case throughout all sectors. Okay? So, if pension fund money begins now to shift away, there's $38 trillion of pension fund money in the world, okay? Uh, so if pension fund money begins to shift, by the way, it's, a, it, it's about 20% of all investable assets, uh, and totally, um, excuse me, professionally managed assets are about $85 trillion now. So if you have $38 trillion of pension fund money beginning to go to companies that deliver solutions uh, that improve uh, the environment and society so that their pensioners can actually enjoy their, their, their retirement, um, then it's going to make a massive um, uh, difference. I think, uh, uh, Rona, we have uh, three more minutes for, the, uh, for another question. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the next one is about impact weighted accounts. Um, yes, impact weighted accounts will turn ESG investing into impact investing. Um, uh, retail investors are going to be able to connect now because we've already seen ETFs, uh, and in fact, ESG related investment has outperformed non ESG related so far this year, according to BlackRock. So, retail investors are able to invest in tracker funds now that are ESG focused with greater transparency, they'll be able to be much more discriminating. Uh, instead of just eliminating companies that uh, manufacture tobacco or or armaments or, uh, or alcohol or gambling, um, you'll be able to say, I don't want to invest in companies that are polluting more than a certain amount or that are not top quartile in their sectors in terms of both profit and impact performance. That's where the game is going. Uh, reshaping the people who make capitalism should be the title of my book. Of course, our system creates our norms and values. Um, 
And currently the norms and values are that if you make a lot of money, you're a very successful person. It doesn't matter how much harm you've done, more or less, caricaturing a bit. We need to shift that, and we will shift that, if impact performance becomes key, to making a contribution during our lives. So those are the questions I can see, uh, Rebecca. Yeah. There is one more, it seems. And I think okay. this is going to be the last one. We have one minute left, so, and then yeah. we'll get... Uh... Yeah. Ac academics are getting seriously engaged. Uh, you're beginning to see not just at, uh, uh, at Harvard, but at uh, business schools throughout the world, uh, courses on impact investing, on reimagining capitalism, and so on. I'm speaking at a dozen uh, business schools uh, at the moment about impact, uh, the book, um, and the ideas uh, in it. Um, I think a younger generation of people will lead. I think you, you represent that generation, Rebecca, just as a younger generation of people led in the tech revolution. But investors played a big role in the tech revolution. By funding venture capital, uh, they funded uh, tech entrepreneurs. And investors have to play a big role now, create allocations for not just ESG, but for impact investment proper, require their companies to be transparent about the impact they create. If governments are going to take longer to act, then investors have to force the pace. Okay. Uh, I think, well, there's one last question that is, when is the book going to be translated into Spanish? So, or if it, if it is already translated into Spanish, some people want to read it no, my as soon as possible. <laughs> There is a lot of demand, uh, not uh, just in Spain, but in Latin America, and uh, I'm pushing my agent to bring it out early next year. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Ronald, for, for your time. I think it was uh, really valuable, um, and it was really, really a, an honor and a pleasure to, to interview you. And uh, I think that uh, now uh, we are going to... Uh, uh, Spain now is going to be reading the manifesto, I believe. Uh, so I, I leave you to that. Uh, and thank you very much, everybody in the audience. And I hope you, you enjoy this, this time with Ronald. And, and uh, uh, looking forward to talking to you again soon in the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative. Ronald, thank you very Likewise. much. Likewise. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank Continue you. your good work. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.